light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine it's entitled just as i am brother matt If you want, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles back to Philippians chapter 1. Uh, we'll be looking there in just a few moments. We are glad that everybody is here. And the words on the screen, I truly believe that is the case, that we are better together. That uh, as we read in the Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9, and 10, that says uh, two are stronger than one, and a cord of three is even stronger. So when we are here together, we are stronger, we are better. And that's been our theme uh, for the month. We're looking at being better. And as we look at that, there are things, you know, some of us may be good enough to stand on our own. Some of us are, are well, let me rephrase that. Some of us are pretty good on our own. You may be pretty good on your own, but when you have someone with you and someone that's helping you, that does make you better. We're not meant to go through this thing alone. We're meant to have things that work together. So I want to give you a string of things that when you look at, on their own, they're good. But when they have something else with it, it's even better. I think you'll see what I'm talking about here. Milk and cookies. All right, you see? Milk is good. Cookies are good. Milk and cookies are better. All right, we got some more. A lot of these are food. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You're sweet and I'm nuts. We're perfect. Isn't that cute? All right. Peanut butter. Peanut butter and jelly. All right. They're good on their own. They hold value on their own, but having them together is just something that makes it better. And if you have one, it seems like you can't have a burger without having fries. That's the value meal. I mean, they put that in there for you. You don't even have to order it anymore. You just give them a number, and they throw the fries in. Chips and salsa. You can tell I was really hungry when I put this together. But there are more. Uh, popcorn and a movie. Can you, eat, can you watch a movie without popcorn? Not many of you. Not many of you. Because we always like to have that popcorn with us. As well. They're both good on their own. But they just seem to fit together. Batman and Robin. All right? We got more. Hall and Oates or Seth and Eddie. Um... <laughs> Seth and Eddie dressed up as Hall and Oates for Halloween, and it kind of just fit. So I thought, I, I don't even know if Hall is good on his own or if Oates were good on their own. But we know that together, they were pretty good. So that's what we're looking at, things that are better together. Now look at these verses that give us that mindset. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. The... I'm going to read you some of these one another passages. That it's, you're better one another. That we're, we're made to love each other. That eat, with each other, we are better together. Be kindly affectionate to one another. With brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. That Romans chapter 12, verse 10. To be able to prefer one another. As Christians, Galatians 6 tells us to do good to all men, especially those that are of the household of faith, that we prefer one another. All right, here's some more. Therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us. As we are together, as we work with one another, we are to receive each other. That means to accept each other. Now, they might, we might not always agree with a lot of people on things, or, or we might not always get along with people on things, but we are still to receive them as our brethren on those matters of opinion if we have problems with because we're brethren. We are better together. Uh, this, uh, this Galatians 5 passage. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, you serve one another. 
For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're to love each other as ourselves. Two more as we get going. Ephesians 4, 2. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. If you want to look at it in a more direct way, I guess you'd say we put up with one another in love at times. We bear with them. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. Those are the terms that were been given together. Someone once wrote this. How important are you? A rooster minus the hen equals no baby chicks. Kellogg's minus a farmer equals no cornflakes. If the nail factory closes, what good is the hammer factory? A cracker maker will do better if there's a cheese maker nearby. The most skillful surgeon still needs the ambulance driver who delivers the patient. Just as Rogers needs Hammerstein, you need someone and someone needs you. That's our whole point of working together. Things that just go better together. That's, that's us as brethren. But as you look in the text this morning, if you look in Philippians 1, there's a few things in this text, a few terms that just simply go better together. Now, they, they're good on their own, and they hold value and weight on their own. And these things, these terms, can stand alone, unlike us. But when you put them together, it makes things so much, so much more beautiful. Look at the first verse of Philippians chapter 1 again. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who were at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you pick it out? It's not Paul and Timothy. It's not the bishops and the deacons. But it's those two terms, grace and and peace. Eighteen times throughout the New Testament, the words grace and peace appear in the same verse. Most of those times, it's the same sentence. And a lot of those are at the very beginning of these epistles. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I give you grace and peace, or I offer you grace and peace. And it's usually grace first. I think it's always grace first, and then peace is following that. Now there again, both of these terms are great on their own. When you think of peace, peace is a wonderful thing. Being able to have a peace of mind, being able to have financial peace, being able to have any kind of peace, just some peace and quiet. All those are good things on their own. Peace is a wonderful asset that you can have in your life. And grace is wonderful. Oh, we cannot, we, we sing about how amazing grace is. When you just think about, just, not just necessarily the grace that God's given to us, but grace if someone gives us grace. If someone shares grace with us. They're both good. But our Lord meant for them to be oftentimes used together. Grace and peace. So for the next couple weeks, this week and next week, I, at least, I want us to look at some things that work together from this passage in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. There's a few terms in here that just fit. And in this specific lesson today, we're going to look at these two words, grace and peace. Let's look at grace for just a second. The Bible refers to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says that he is the God of all grace. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. He is the God of all grace. Grace means unmerited favor, benefit, gift, a gift that is unmerited, Something that is given to us that is free. There was a young lady that was teaching a, an elementary 
Bible class on Sunday morning. They were talking about when God came to Abraham and told him that he was going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham begins to go through the numbers game. Uh, if there are 50 righteous people, will you destroy the city? If there are 45 righteous people, will you spare the city? If there's 35 righteous people, and he gets going down and down and down until he gets to the 10. If there are 10 righteous people, will you still destroy the city? And the Lord said he would spare the city if he could find 10 righteous people. And the teacher asked these, these kids, these 7 and 8 year olds, they said, what do you think that means? What was Abraham doing when he's trying to barter with God, so to speak, or try to find out what God's going to do? And the little boy said to the teacher, I think Abraham's trying to push his luck. Don't we do that? How often do we try to just push our luck with God just to see how much we can get by with? Just how much we can, we can almost, without saying it, dare him? We don't want to go full-blown into things, but if we just give just a little, maybe God will see that that appeases him. Or maybe God will appreciate my willingness to get up a little early this morning and come to services. Or, or maybe me giving a little will be just all right that we just, we just push. God, do we have to do all of this? What if we just do this much? Or what if we just do this much? Or we keep going littler and littler until we find out just what is the bare minimum that we're able to do. See, when God went to that city, we know that God destroyed the city. We know that God destroyed it because of, of all the wickedness that was there. But he did spare those that were righteous. That we see God's grace was shared on those that really cared about him. And that really worked for him. And trusted in him. Even a Lot's wife, she didn't trust enough. That's why she turned around and became a pillar of salt. But because Lot trusted, he was spared. See, God is a God of all grace. That even in the midst of a, of a world that is awful like maybe ours might be. I don't think we're to the point of Sodom and Gomorrah. But God still shares his grace with us. The God of all grace. And listen to what this grace will do. Who's called us to his eternal glory when we've suffered a while. That that grace will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. What about us sharing grace with one another? I mean, we might be gracious sometimes, but not all the time. Look at what God means when he talks about being gracious in Psalm 103, the Lord is merciful and gracious. Now listen how that is defined, church. Now we're going to really step on toes, including my own. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. See, when we, when we seek to understand what grace is, we need to be gracious towards one another. Just as God, God is not, he's very slow to anger with us. When you think about God, if God had the temper that we had, if God had the short fuse that we had, the world would have been destroyed a long time ago, wouldn't it? There would be no earth here left. But God is gracious in the fact that he is giving us that unmerited favor. He has slow to anger. He is not punishing us according to our iniquities. The punishment is not fitting the crime. When, when we look, he has not dealt with us according to our sins as we deserve to do. As we deserve to be dealt with. He has not given us those things that need to be given to us. In fact, he's giving us just the opposite of that unmerited favor in grace. And trying to understand that concept of what it means. You know, the, the famous denominational preacher, Billy Graham. When he was a young man, Billy Graham was driving through a small town and he had gotten pulled over and gotten a speeding ticket. He was 10 miles over the speed limit. The police officer didn't recognize him. It was he was still young, so 
The police officer wrote him a ticket and said, you have to appear in court. So weeks later, the minister went to court and stood there before the judge. The judge called out the case number, pulled it up, and called the man's name and looked at him and recognized Mr. Graham, looked at him and said, Billy Graham, you have been guilty. You have been charged with driving 10 miles over the speed limit. How do you plead, innocent or guilty? Mr. Graham said, I plead guilty, sir. He said, well, since you pled guilty, you have, there has to be a fine that is paid. There is a fee that must be paid because you were guilty, and that guilt, that crime, must be paid for. It is $1 for every mile you've been over the speed limit. Now, that's how long ago it's been. <laughs> $1 for every mile you went over the speed limit. And the judge pulled out his wallet and he said, I'm going to pay the fine for you. Not only did he pay his fine, but the judge adjourned the court and took the minister out for a steak dinner. And Mr. Graham, when he's preaching in his next sermon, when he's talking about grace and he comes across it, he tells that story and he says, now that is grace. That I deserve to be punished for what I did. But my crime was not paid for by me. I didn't have to pay for the crime myself. Someone else, the judge, the righteous judge, paid that price for me. And not only did he do that, but he took me out to a feast of a steak dinner. That's what God does for us, church. He doesn't punish us according to the crimes that we deserve. He paid that price for us so that when the time comes, we'll be able to share in that. It won't be a steak dinner. It'll be a much more bountiful feast that we'll be able to have when we're in heaven with him. Grace. Looking some more. A couple more of these verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. But it's more than that one event. It's more than that one-time act of grace that God's given to us. We need grace on a continual basis. We need it on a daily basis. So we have passages like this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles, Paul says, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was working within me, or which was within me. Paul says that I didn't deserve to be where I am. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I didn't deserve to get this role. I persecuted the church. I was harsh toward the church of God. But it's by the grace of God that I am what I am. And I worked hard afterwards. I worked hard. He says, I labored more abundantly than they all. That means Paul is saying, you got Peter, James, and John, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, all those 12 apostles that spent that time with Jesus. I've worked harder than all of them because I felt like I was playing catch up because I didn't deserve the the calling of apostle. I didn't deserve that gift of being given by God, that mercy and that grace. But it really wasn't I that did all that. Yet not me, but it was the grace of God that pushed me, that provoked me, that was instilled in me, that drove me. That's what Paul is saying. We need a great, we need that grace. We need it on a daily basis. How many of us feel like every day we fall so short? How many of you feel every day that you fail in comparison to what you want to be? How many of you, when you lay your head down on your pillow at night, you sit and think, I was not what I originally intended to be this morning? I think we all fit into that category. That's why we need the grace. See, grace, it's able to stand on its own. It's wonderful to have, and it's a gift that God's given us, and it's, it's something that, we can, that holds value all by itself. But then we bring peace into the picture. Grace and peace. And when we find the peace that comes with that grace, it just kind of fits together and goes better together. 
peace. This is what it means. A harmonious relationship between nations, friends, a freedom from molestation. The harmonized relationship between God and man brought about by the gospel to give us the sense of rest and contentment. It is an inner peace, an assurance that you cannot fully understand it, but you can only have it if you have grace. Now you think of what that means, a harmonious relationship, something that fits in harmony between God and man, between nations, between friends, between a, a freedom of being molested, a freedom from being taken advantage of. You have a peace of mind of knowing that this is going to be fine, that this is going to be all right, that there is you and God and you are good that you're on good terms. But that peace only comes. That inner feeling of peace only comes when it's accompanied with that grace. Now let me show you what I mean. Let's look at a few verses here. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, Paul says, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now let's hold up and let's talk about this for just a second. As we read in this passage here, Paul is letting us know that because of my arrogance, maybe, because of my pride that I might have, because of me working harder than all of the other apostles and doing that, even though I said it was God working within me, God felt it necessary to send me something, to send this thorn in my flesh. And I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. But this is why it was given to me. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions. Now, the way this sentence is laid out, if, if you see this, let me, let me just point this out right here. If you see the way this sentence is laid out, Therefore, because of, I take pleasure in my infirmities, and then it's got that comma there, and then it mentions in reproaches, in needs. That means you can take this phrase, I take pleasure in, with all of these ends. I take pleasure in my infirmities. I take pleasure in my reproaches. I take pleasure in my needs. I take pleasure in my persecution. That I'm able to take pleasure in my distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, that's when I'm strong. He says, I can take pleasure in these things. I can have peace with these things. I can be content with these things. I can rest in these things. I can have that harmonious relationship between me and these persecutions and these distresses and these pains. I can have peace and contentment with this problem. Why? We trace the verse back and you see, because of his grace, that is enough for me. Jesus talks a great deal about this. Look in, I'm going to read these passages. Look in John chapter 14. I want you to see something here. You know John is, I love the, the God, I love all the gospels, I love all the works of God, but the gospel of John has a special place in my heart and and when I read it, I just I find a, a personal list that I don't see or that I don't feel in the others, but that may not be true for you. But I want you to read here with me of this peace that God talks about in verses 25, uh, verse 27, 14, 27. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. 
I'm giving you my peace. Here's my peace. The peace I leave with you, the peace that I'm going to give with you, don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Have this peace. Now listen to why you can have this peace. Go back in the verses before. Look at verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Now, is that not grace? Is God not showing grace? He says, this peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. Don't be afraid. Don't worry that I've got something coming. I'm going to give you this peace to know this. And here's why. Because I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send somebody there with you. I'm going to send you my spirit, the comforter, the advocate. And he's going to be with you there, and he's going to strengthen you. He's going to give you what you need. He's going to call into remembrance all that I've done for you. And God is showing, here's the grace, here's the peace. One more time in the Gospel of John. Look at this one. John chapter 16, verse 33. Just moments later, Jesus says in chapter 16, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In this world, I'm speaking to you now in this world that you may have peace. Now look at, look at where the grace comes in, in chapter 17. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify with you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, and he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you've given to me. And now, O oh Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory with which I had before the world was. Do you see what comes in that passage? You see what Jesus is saying in that passage? He's praying to the Father. In the holiest of holies, he's praying to God. And he says to them about giving them eternal life. There's the grace. The peace and the grace. The grace and the peace that's laid out for us. Peace comes from having a knowledge and understanding of God. There's a couple more verses that will be done for the morning. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That that comes from that, that grace and peace continues to come. Remember in Romans chapter 6 when Paul is talking to the church at Rome and he's talking about sin and how they continue to sin and how they need grace. And in that passage in chapter 6, he says, what shall we say then? He's asking that rhetorical question that they might be asking. They're thinking themselves, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin and hope that grace may abound? Meaning that the more we sin, the more grace we get. If that's the case, should we just keep on sinning more so that we get more grace? No, that's not it at all. That we get just enough grace to cover our sins and we get more grace when we understand, when we have this knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ that only comes through study, that only comes through reading, that only comes through meditation of God's Word, that these, these attributes of grace and peace can be multiplied. Multiplied. Multiplied means exponentially there. That you can increase that number very quickly, exponentially, by putting forth the effort into that. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It's because of grace that we can have peace, because God says we get what we need. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that way we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If we know whatever we need, whatever problems we may have, if God is going to give us what we need, that gives us what? Peace. You see how it works together? Grace and peace. 
But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. If we look, I've said this often when I'm studying the Bible with someone, trying to show them the way of the truth. You can go through the accounts of the Acts, and you can say, if it saved them, I can rest assured that it's going to save me. That I know if I do what they did, then I'll be able to get what they get. That if I, if I go through the actions that they did, the faith in God, the belief, the repentance, the confession... If I go through the baptism like they did, like the eunuch did in Acts 8, like Cornelius did in Acts 10, like they did in Acts 2, if I go through what they did, I'll get what they get. That's what this verse says. We believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we shall be saved in the same manner as they. That gives me peace to know if I do what they did, I get what they got. That's peace. So when we look at these things, they stand on their own. They're beautiful on their own. When we look at grace, what we, when we get what we don't deserve, that God takes care of us, that he's slow to anger on us and he doesn't punish us when we deserve it, but he's long-suffering to us, not willing that we perish, that's wonderful. That's a great thing to have in our life. And then peace, that's a wonderful thing for us to have in our life, to know that we have this Peace and contentment and a harmonious relationship with things. But when you put the two together and you have grace and peace working together in our lives, we go back to that passage in Philippians chapter 1. As Paul writes to Timothy, or Paul and Timothy write to the church at Philippi, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, He's able to say, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I may be talking about things that are just things you don't know a whole lot about. You know what grace is. You've read about it. You've been coming to church for years. And you, you understand what that grace is to an extent. But there may be some of you that don't really have that peace. If you don't have that peace, church, you need the grace more. And the only way to get that grace more is to allow Christ to put it in your life. Let it be multiplied to you as you put forth the effort. But if you don't have that peace, so as we get ready to sing this this song of invitation. As we get ready to sing this song, Just As I Am. The, that, let that word peace be going through your mind as you sing this song. Let the word peace, see if you feel that peace. See if you understand what that peace is. See if you're able to experience that peace during that invitation song. But if there's something in your life that's amiss and you feel some contention in your heart, you feel some struggle going on in your life where you know, I don't have that peace that I need. I know what peace is. I wish I had it. I wish I could have it. I wish I could just forget all these problems that I'm having. You can. You might not be able to forget them, but you can have that peace. But it must be a decision that you make, a willingness in your life to surrender some things to Him, to surrender your life to Him and be able through faith, repentance, and baptism or just confession of faults that you've got in your life be able to experience that peace. If you can't feel that peace as we sing this song, then here is your opportunity to leave here and be able to experience it as we stand and sing that song of encouragement. Shine, Jesus, shine Fill this land with the Father's glory Spirit blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy.